Sorry, I don't love you. A friend I've grown accustomed to. Cause with you, something isn't wrong. Something isn't wrong. Something isn't right. I wish you could be happy. Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is back. As is Tim Matthews. Last week, we talked all about the first Mission Impossible movie, and we are back again to talk about Mission Impossible 2. This was one I most certainly hadn't watched, but Tim, I know you are obviously a big fan of this franchise, and we'll probably make our way through all six movies at some point here. I know I have definitely seen the third one, as we discussed last time, so we'll do that one sometime soon here, but with this one, you know... We're just going to dive right in and start by talking about the story, because for me, I felt like the story was decent, but it wasn't quite as effective as the story in the first movie, because you have sort of a very different motive for this story. And while there are still a lot of lives at stake, you never really feel that way necessarily. And I think, you know, with the virus that's being threatened to go around, you know, Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt is solely focused on Tandy Newton's Nia Hall. So it doesn't seem like the stakes are quite as high as they could have been. Yeah, yeah, I, I would definitely agree. It's like you have we we get all these examples uh through dialogue and then also through like some of the visual stuff to show like how horrible this virus really is and that if this virus gets out yeah it's going to be terrible but like the closest we ever get to the sense of dread that it's going to affect a ton of people is when they just drop her off in the in the middle of the town which we don't even really we don't really even get much with that because we're so focused on on Ethan uh, already on the island and like kind of like taking care of everything. And yeah, it's just kind of like Ethan, Ethan kind of always seems to have a pretty decent grasp on, on, uh, on taking care of the situation. And then uh, as far as like the virus goes, and then outside of that, it's just uh, this, I guess, revenge uh, story uh, between the two of them. Uh, And then it kind of like, I I mentioned uh, prior to this that I was reading the John uh, Film School Rejects uh, John Woo's commentary for the movie, and he apparently wanted to make a love story, and then the spy stuff was secondary. And I think that's pretty clear in the execution of the movie. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And even when Naya is dropped off in the middle of the city, we really only see her as a gps dot pretty much and i think that's part of what made that moment less effective because then it feels like the next time we see her she's just by herself standing on a cliff yeah it's it's like wait i thought she was like dropped off in a major town and somehow (laughs) she found her uh, way all the way to this cliff away from everyone (laughs) yeah the attention i feel like would have probably been a bit better if we had her just in this town and like the countdown's coming the countdown's coming and she's in a town with a bunch of people. Um, But then I guess, you know, where does Luther land the helicopter? (laughs) Also true. Because of it taking place in Australia too, you know, I think it's Sydney that she's supposed to be dropped off in the middle of or something like that. One of those very large cities in Australia. And I wonder if they just didn't have maybe the budget to film there by the end of the movie, because this is all happening towards the tail end. And, when we're about to get the final scenes and everything like that. So I'm wondering if maybe it was a budget thing and they just didn't have the capacity to have all of those extras in the movie at that point or something like that. Because That's a possibility, yeah. you can tell that based on the amount of action scenes, and I think, you know, this is kind of a good segue into those because I do have quite a few thoughts on the action scenes in this because one, there are, a lot more action scenes in this than there were in the first movie. (laughs) Yeah. Like way more. It's definitely dialed up to 11. Yeah. And they use so much slow motion and (laughs) I, I get it. But at the same time, I don't really like slow motion action scenes at all. I think, you know, I've made note of this in quite a few of the Marvel 
movie episodes that I have done on this podcast. And it's one of those things. It's like, do we really need to see the, some of these things in slow motion for them to be effective? It's like, okay, the dude dodged a punch. We don't need to see that in slow motion. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just one of those things where it felt a little too overdone. And I think it also made some of the action scenes drag out longer than necessary. Oh yeah. And the, the I mean, with the, with the slow motion and stuff, it, I feel like that is one of the biggest things that dates this movie so much because it, it feels so much like a product within like the matrix era of over the top insane action. And, um, with the over dramatic, uh, slow motion mixed with, you know, tons of like close ups and everything and the, the, um, the, the one that really, really stood out to me is in that final fight on the beach where they actually not only they they move away from slow motion after uh, after he does like some big kick or something. But then they do like five like quick cuts of Ethan screaming and going in for like a punch and they just they do that same shot and they cut it in like five times and i i'm sure that's very very john woo style i'm not right. like a, a huge uh i'm not hugely educated in his uh filmography but it it definitely uh it definitely has from my understanding his uh his style um you know punched punched into every little bit of it and i mean that's that's what they set out to do with the movie um i guess one of the things that that John Woo was concerned about was competing with Brian De Palma's style from the first one. But at the time of the series, Tom Cruise was adamant of, no, he wants every director to put their own spin on it and their own feel. And I think that's a cool idea. Um, but it also, I think in this case resulted in a, in a film that kind of struggles to match up to the first one because it it is so drastically different and kind of, and a, a lot more over the top. It's not a, not a gradual growth from film to film. Yeah, and you always have that struggle when it comes to making sequels of any kind. You know, it's a lot like when you hear about the sophomore slump in music. You're like, "Okay, well, you ha put out such a great debut, but what are you going to do now?" And I think for some franchises, that is something that is very difficult, even though you have six movies of this now. It's had its ups and downs, and the same can most certainly be said of Fast and the Furious <laughs> as a franchise, and even Marvel to an extent, too. You know, while a lot of people do praise Marvel's work that they've done, over the 20 movies, there have certainly been ups and downs because you have 20 oh, yeah. movies, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I feel like just by sheer math and the amount of films you're going to have, like you're not going to be riding high on every single one of them. Exactly. Like I said, you know, the action scenes sort of made this a little more drawn out than it needed to be. But you brought up the fact that you see that sort of this same move from different angles. And to me, at times that felt really, really choppy because it wasn't like continuous movement from different angles. I would notice it's like, you know, okay, Ethan had already started a punch and then you cut to a different angle and it's like the punches move back a little more. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. some of the editing choices, I was like, uh, okay, I don't, I get it, but I don't think this was totally necessary or you know just the fact that maybe it wasn't edited as well as it could have been because had they done the different angles and had it still look continuous at least instead of mm -hmm. being as choppy as some of the scenes were I think that would have played a little better but in my opinion I was like okay you know when I was talking with you about the first movie I made the point that they didn't have action scenes for the sake of having action scenes whereas in this one it felt like they were like okay time for lots of action oh yeah and we don't really need to have a complete reason for it but you know these guys don't like each other so we're gonna make them punch each other <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the the action the action scenes are you know they're fun and i mean especially the 
uh, the one uh, where he goes to kill the virus. Uh, it's a really well done action sequence, even if it is super out of style from uh, uh, from the first movie. It's uh, that's a a well done scene. Right. Uh, I do uh, thoroughly enjoy uh, Tom Cruise's uh, overacting uh, in this movie at times. I, I feel like everyone's kind of overacting. They they all they're all pushing it to another level. The the one that always stands out to me is when he like shoots the wall and it blows up, and then he's just like, "Just stay alive!" <laughs> it cracks me up every time. <laughs> but it's like I it's like I love it for probably the wrong reasons. I love it because it makes me laugh because it's just silly, and I don't know if that's the point, but. Uh, but then you have scenes like the uh, where I think this movie does really shine. And the ones where it does, I think, are are the ones that do feel like they could have fit more in line with the first one. Like the horse race scene, I think, right. is awesome. The way uh, the way Billy drops off like the program and it says like kind of a little code phrase so that she knows what page to look at. And then she's got like the little camera and uh, um, and uh or just looking through the binoculars through the, and talking to Ethan through the earpiece. And then just that whole way that they, all that espionage that happens with this horse race happening in the background. I love that scene. I'd, I'd turn back and watch that one again when I was rewatching it. Cause it's, it, that one really stands out. And I'm like, it, sometimes I wonder what would it have been like if the series continued more in line with the first one. And maybe it doesn't become a sex, sex, uh, like successful as the series ended up becoming. I don't know, but it, it definitely, this was such a huge jump uh, to another direction. And when I see scenes like that, I'm like, Oh man, like that's mission impossible. Um, Yeah. But, um, but the action's fun too. (laughs) Yeah. One other thing I want to touch on real quick here before we move on to talking about some of the cast and new characters and everything are the uses of the different like face masks that they <laughs> frequently use because we saw that in the first movie yeah but i feel like we saw it way more in this one and i was like is this totally necessary like this is a lot <laughs> and yeah, you know they have the <laughs> they have like the little voice changers that they just like put on their throat basically and i was like you know, I get the idea, but I don't know if that's a thing that actually worked back then. <laughs> well, and I, I want to point out one specifically uh, as I was doing my rewatch, because one, yeah, they they overuse them so much in this right. movie. Uh, but one that really stood out to me um, in terms of in terms of logic, uh, where it takes it so far that I can no longer have the suspension of disbelief. Uh, it starts with one of the coolest but more ridiculous scenes of the movie is when the door blows up. Ethan's walking past the fire. You have that, yeah. you know, <laughs> huge music playing and the dove flies through all the doves, all the doves. And then <laughs> um, and and then um, Ambrose's henchman, uh, like second uh, right hand man goes after Ethan, who I also feel like that guy's a Walmart Sean Bean. <laughs> and. Um, so he goes after him and then he and Ethan fight and everything. And then when he brings him back, we end up finding out that Ethan has somehow made a mask of that guy and made a, a vocal tape of him in this short period of time. I'm assuming he has this equipment in his little backpack that he brought with him. Right. Uh, cause I'm not sure how or he had it pre-made. Worked. Like, Yeah. And I'm like, how does he have like all that ready? Like, I don't think he's had any interaction with with this guy. And we we didn't see anybody else get the, you know, record like a vocal pattern for his audio. And like that, that is when it really takes it to a whole new level of the masks. But we do get that great moment of Ethan going in slow motion, walking, uh, running down the hallway. And then as soon as he rips the mask off, it goes back into regular time. And it's like. It it's awesome and I get like pumped up, but at the same time I'm like, this is so absurd and there are way too many masks in this movie. <laughs> the first scene starts with a mask reveal. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then Sean uses a mask of Ethan again later to get Naya drawn out and he starts piecing things together and it's just like, Oh, come on. 
would even yeah. really show up and tell you to go back inside <laughs> sort of yeah. thing and just be like, oh, no, plans change. Sorry, hon. <laughs> yeah. Just just stopping in to say, hey, you know, how's things going? Going to need you to hang out more. It's like, what? <laughs> exactly. But I think now we can talk a bit about the characters because, you know, we mentioned Sean. He's the new villain, so to speak. And Hugh was his right hand man until Sean was tricked into being a little trigger happy and shooting him thinking it was Ethan yeah. which yeah. you know that just proves Ethan's point about him so much and you're like yep see dude this is what you get <laughs> yeah if you didn't use masks all the time this wouldn't have happened right and then obviously Naya is the love interest played by Tandy Newton and you know I had heard about this actress going into watching Solo, a Star Wars story, but I don't recall ever really seeing her in too much. To, so then to go back and watch this, you know, not too long after seeing Solo, I was like, okay, you know, I get why people really like her as an actress and I'll probably, you know, go see what else she has been in just for the sake of knowing now. Yeah, I think is she on Westworld? Yes. Okay. I have I have not watched that. Yeah, I think that that was when I was rewatching this, I was like I was like she's so familiar, so familiar. And, but it still wasn't even because this is a, such an older movie, it didn't click with me. Um and then when I was looking at her IMDb, I was like, "Ah, oh, it's the Westworld girl." So, um but then uh yeah, that's right. I forgot she was in Solo briefly. Yeah, she didn't last very long in Solo, which yeah. I think was a big <laughs> disappointment to a lot of people. But aside from her, you know, Sean obviously plays the biggest role along with his various henchmen. And Hugh is the one we get to know the most because, like you said, he's his right hand man. And I think he makes a good villain, but because of the focus on the action scenes, this didn't feel quite as story driven as the first movie did. So in a way, you're like, okay, yes, we have these new characters, but do we really care about any of them other than Naya? I'm sort of leaning towards no, not really, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it, he definitely, I mean, he checks all the boxes of being a solid villain. And we get, like, we get that scene of him, uh, you know, cutting off part of Hugh's uh, finger and uh, you're like sitting there and you're like this guy like he's really intense he's really selling the scene and I'm like yeah like this guy is a really really bad guy but it's just he's kind of I guess I guess he's supposed to just be like the anti-Ethan he's just supposed to be like everything Ethan is but on like the wrong side of it right. um, and uh, I think that definitely it makes for a really interesting concept of the two of them going up against each other, but we definitely don't get really, really much. Uh, we don't get much between the two of them for me to like truly care that they're going after each other because it's just, we're just kind of told through exposition that it's like, all right, he, he's doubled Ethan a f uh, number of times and now uh, Ethan doesn't really, uh, doesn't tend to like his uh his methods because he goes a little a little more brutal um whereas uh as ambrose says in a line in the movie he says uh ethan hunt favors misdirection over confrontation and ambrose is the other side and it's like we're just kind of told these things to so that we sit there and say oh yeah i understand why they're going up against each other but through exposition i mean that doesn't really give me a reason to be like oh man, like I can't wait to see these two go, go up against each other. It's, I just kind of know it's going to happen. Exactly. For me, I think the most underused character too is Mission Commander Swanbeck, who is played by Anthony Hopkins. And on IMDb, it says he's like not even credited. And I find that so fascinating because it's like, how do you not use Anthony Hopkins more if you have him in your movie? It's like he shows up towards the beginning and then again at the end when the mission is over and you're like, oh, OK, that that's it. That's all we're getting. OK. All right. Yeah. I guess I guess we're, I guess we're done with him. <laughs> yeah. And and, you know, uh, slight uh, slight spoiler for the rest of the movies. That is the last time you see Anthony Hopkins. So it's like you get you get the 
you know, great Anthony Hopkins, but then he's, he's never used throughout the rest of the series. Um, and, uh, and apparently they originally wanted Ian McKellen as, uh, Ethan Hunt's boss. Okay. Uh, but scheduling conflicts, uh, prevented him from being able to do it. And apparently, um, uh, the producer, Paula Wagner told John Wu that Anthony Hopkins wanted the part. So they didn't even necessarily go after him. He like wanted to be in it. Um, and they were like, uh, John Wu was apparently like really shocked about that. And he was so excited. He couldn't sleep and everything. And it's like, it's like, so not only do you have Anthony Hopkins like that you casted him, but you know, for some reason he just wanted to, you know, do something in this franchise. And, uh, and then you, you give him like 10 minutes, I feel. And he doesn't really get to, I mean, he's fantastic. Like the scenes he's in, he's great. I mean, he's Anthony Hopkins. He always is. Right. But we don't get like, you're just like, uh, you could have given him like a bit more of like meat to his role and he could have chewed some scenery a bit more. Especially since this is like, maybe peak Anthony Hopkins time because it's literally a year before he does Hannibal or before the movie comes out. So he had probably already been working on it. And I'm wondering if that's why he didn't have as big of a role in Mission Impossible 2 because that and Hannibal were only a year apart. Oh, that's true. I didn't think of that. Yeah. And then, yeah, that was Hannibal. (laughs) Yeah. And then he goes from that to being Odin. (laughs) Oh, Several yeah. years later, <laughs> I mean, he did have lots of lots of stuff in between. But I think, you know, for a lot of people, they would say the Hannibal movies were probably some of his best. Unless I'm completely off base on this, but I've seen those movies, and I think he's pretty darn creepy in them. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's yeah, it, it's pretty much even in the even in what people may consider the the lesser of the Hannibal Lecter movies. He is never the complaint. Like right. it's always, yeah, he's great. The other parts, but so it's you get Anthony Hopkins, he shows up and he kicks ass. Like that's just yeah, and he's in Westworld too. Apparently, everyone is in Westworld, and I have not been yeah. paying attention. Yeah, he's he's really really good in Westworld. So if you do get around to that, any bit of this movie where you felt like you didn't get enough Anthony Hopkins, you get all the Anthony Hopkins you wanted in Westworld. Yeah, and even some of the characters we don't see as much are sort of bigger names now. Like one of the henchmen, Ulrich, was played by Dominic Purcell. And anyone who watches superhero stuff knows that he has been in The Flash and Legends of Tomorrow, as well as a lengthy run on Prison Break. So it's like, you know, this was before he really broke out as an actor. So it's always interesting to see people in those roles i don't even know if he speaks in this but he's yeah, definitely sure. one of the henchmen and i i looked at him i was like wow that does not look like the same dude at all <laughs> that's really funny i completely it's like it wasn't until you you mentioned that and now i'm just like oh my god he was in those shows <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah it's funny how that works especially you know since this movie came out 18 years ago you know it's like oh okay (laughs) yeah 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 (laughs) also that wow so long ago and i think i saw this you can't (laughs) you can't help but be like oh okay so all of these people showed up in this and now we know them from so many other things i just always find that interesting when i go back and watch older movies that i have not seen before i'm like oh okay i'm starting to see where these people got their start sort of thing absolutely I mean, shout out to Luther. I mean, we we definitely get we get some fun stuff with Luther. Uh, I was happy. I'm always happy to see him back. Yeah, he has one of my favorite moments in the movie. So I think we can go ahead and talk about some more of our favorite moments because you have that scene where he nearly gets blown up in the van, but he gets out just in time, and it pays off later in the movie when he's in the helicopter and he's talking about how he's mad and it was just so funny because he his character isn't one that really seems to get mad because you know he's not the muscle he's the tech guy and he has like this rocket launcher bazooka thing and he just like lets them rip and he's like yeah you know and that's what they get for making him mad so it's like yes thank you luther (laughs) I think they're they're shooting at him and they uh they shoot a hole like through his Versace jacket or something oh, like yes, that. Oh yes, that too. Then, <laughs> yeah. 
and he steps in a he steps in like poop when he gets to yeah. the place and he's <laughs> he's very not happy about it yeah he he's definitely uh fantastic the the other guy like billy he he's got some solid moments but i i, I think it's i think it's obvious why uh he doesn't really follow through with the rest of the series because he kind of comes in and he's got some nice moments, but he, he doesn't get to shine like uh, like Luther does. And I think, too, he's more local. So if they oh, don't true. really go back to Australia, that would make sense as well. But, you know, it seems like I wouldn't necessarily say that Luther is Ethan's right hand man, but he's definitely his like go to behind the scenes guy. Absolutely. Yeah. And the. um. In the uh, TV show, the the seri- the episode would always start with the leader of the team. Uh, I forget. It, it's not Jim Phelps at first. I think in the first season, someone else. But either way, the leader of the team, it, it's them going through files. And each episode, it show, they're, putting, they're throwing different files down on the table. And that shows you which team is going to be in that particular episode. And there's different characters that rotate and everything. Um, but there's certain team members that they're in every single episode and so it's like they're always the go-to people um and i feel like luther's definitely in that that it's like if ethan's going on uh going on a mission unless there's some reason that luther you know is off doing some other mission like if ethan can have him he has luther yeah exactly he definitely trusts him more than anybody else and he's certainly proven himself to not only with the first movie, but even through the second one. So in a way, now that I have seen two of these in a row here, it makes perfect sense that he's a character who would be a staple throughout all six of the movies. Because it's like, yes, Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt is obviously the main player in all of these movies, but it's nice to have some other consistency with franchises like this absolutely and i think that's that's another thing that that i think weakens this movie from the others is that uh ethan is so pushed towards the forefront of being the main driver of this that when you get the team moments those shine uh a lot more like at the the horse race because i mean that's what's so fun is watching uh watching this team work together to figure this out and when it when it kind of moves away from the team and the team is more in the background, which this movie uh, tends to do a lot more than the others. Um, I think that's when this movie becomes definitely weaker than, than the rest of the series. Right. Cause we want to see more of the team. I would definitely agree with you about the horse race scene too. That's just some well done spy movie tropes there because this movie was definitely like you said, a lot better when they were all working together. And even in that action scene where he's trying to destroy the virus and Sean and his men show up, you know, Luther is so worried that he can't get through to him to tell him that Naya is in the building because he sees the GPS tracker in there. But because the generators have turned on, he has, I believe it was like 20 minutes or something where he couldn't talk to Ethan. And he still had like over five minutes left and he was just sort of in this panic. And that's when you really see them not necessarily together as a team, but they're still working as a team because Luther is showing so much concern for Ethan and Naya in that moment. And one of the things, too, is just the fact that Naya took on this challenge and she had no training, you know, that was a big concern towards the beginning of the movie. It's like, you know, she's not built for this, but she proves to them that she can handle herself just fine, even though injecting herself with the disease might not have been the smartest choice in the world, but she knows that it's the only way to keep it out of Sean's hands. So I think that entire scene and the horse race scene, it's like, okay, you know, these are sort of the highlights of the movie, at least for me. Absolutely. And like we we're like you were saying that, um, you know, in the first movie, the the few action scenes that that were there, they serve the story. They don't feel like action scenes just to be action scenes. Right. And I think the scene where he goes to kill the virus and at uh, the biosite building, that is a scene that that action 
were that all everything that happens in that scene, the action, uh, the emotional aspect, the team aspect, um, the confrontation with uh, with Ambrose, that is, I think, one of the best action scenes in the movie because it feels like it fits. It Absolutely. naturally grows into that scene. It's not like, all right, now we're going to have a big shootout. The tension builds up and builds up. As you said, Luther's trying to say to him, you know, uh, Nye's in the building. They're they're almost to you and Ethan can't hear. And then it's it gets a nice uh, little comical payoff when Luther finally does get through to him and he says Nye's in the building over the radio. And you just see the look on Ethan's face and he's just like, thanks. Thanks, Luther. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plus, you have the fact that they're having this big shootout, but Sean keeps having to yell at his men to stop shooting so that they don't shoot the virus and get yeah. everyone sick. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, come on, guys. We know you're hired guns, but have a little common sense. <laughs> I know. It's it's always like the uh, it's always like in action movies that when they get all like the mass amount of henchmen that it's just kind of like, is it... Um, is it just through like a temp program for for henchmen <laughs> that they can and they just get like a they get a group deal on a bunch of guys you know they're not the best but you could get them uh, you get them for a solid deal you don't have to pay them that much and you know they'll probably screw something up but for the most part they're fine. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember what I was watching. It might have been the animated Spider Man show that's out now, but there was literally someone who made an app called henchmen or something and you could just <laughs> hire people from the app to go do these things for you i it's really bothering me that i can't remember what show it was that's hilarious <laughs> yeah it, it it's exactly what you're talking about though so that's pretty funny it's like there's some sort of underground network where it's like okay you know here's a lineup of dudes take your pick <laughs> yeah <laughs> Aside from, you know, those few favorite moments, is there anything else you want to talk about for this movie? Even though it was longer, like you said, before we started recording, there's probably not quite as much to say just because of the fact that it is a sequel and it it works, but it doesn't stand up totally to the first movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the uh, this this movie, I think, you know, it definitely is the next big step towards... Uh, towards what a lot of people think makes these uh, movies special is Tom Cruise doing the real stunt work. You know, even though there's there's definitely more green screen uh, used in this movie. Right. But as I was watching on the behind the scenes stuff, Tom Cruise is still doing these huge stunts like jumping out the window and all that stuff. Or even just when he's like free climbing or whatever yeah. it's actually called. I was like, that looks painful. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that apparently, apparently the main theme was supposed to go like the plane was supposed to crash and then go right into the main theme. But Tom Cruise didn't think that was exciting enough. Uh, so he wanted to climb a mountain. <laughs> and, and that's what brought on that scene. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's like, yeah, it it looks painful. You know, it's the shot beautifully you know seeing you know that grand scale of the mountain he's on um when he's like doing the the like surfing on the street off of the motorcycle like he right. is really yeah. doing all those things he has safety cables and everything but so it's like the the stunt work is still you know uh really cool and exciting that he's actually doing it but this movie definitely i think focuses so much more on that stuff and then at times forgets that it needs to have a really solid story to back it as well. But thankfully in the movies to come, the, you know, the, the stunts are definitely all still there, but they remember that they need a solid story too. <laughs> so I definitely, I mean, this, this one, it's a ton of fun in that just it's super insane way. Um, but the series, I think definitely gets back on track and, goes up from here so it, it dipped a little bit after the first one but um but i'm excited to get to talk about the third one as well because that one gets back to more of the things that we that we really enjoyed from the first one yeah plus like you said you know he let the directors 
put their own spin on these things. And I think that's something that really stands out with this second movie. Whether people think that's for better or worse is, you know, totally up to them. But it was fine. It was a perfectly yeah. fine action movie, even though I'm not a huge fan of all the slow motion. It's like there was yeah. enough that wasn't slow motion to where I wasn't like ready to pull my hair out. <laughs> so you I could have used more doves. I need more doves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I yeah, I think like five more doves and we, we yeah. would have been good, you know? <laughs> yeah. Six, that's too much, but five more, that would have been perfect. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Some of this was just completely ridiculous at times, but then you have those really great moments that kind of sort of make up for it and really just make it a perfectly fine movie to sit down and not think too hard about so yeah. <laughs> that that works for me sometimes you're like okay time to watch an action movie that may or may not have a story yeah if you it's like if you're watching the first one and then there's certain scenes that if you if you look away or, or leave the room real quick and then you come back you're just gonna be like holy crap I definitely missed something because I have no idea what's going on. You could probably go in and out of this movie and still catch <laughs> catch enough to be like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, going after the bad guy. We're going to see some more action. Yeah, it's <laughs> definitely a more uh, relaxed viewing experience, but um, it's fun for uh, fun for what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tim, thank you so much for coming on to talk about this second movie. I know this was a little bit shorter of an episode, but that's totally fine. I think yeah. sometimes people like shorter episodes. And, you know, like I said, I have the third movie, so I can watch that anytime here. I think, you know, we might take a short break from the Mission Impossible movies. I do have episode 100 coming up next, and we should have oh, a pretty nice. fun Pixar episode with Jacob Tender. That is definitely exciting for me because one, I can't believe people listen to me talk as much as <laughs> some people do. So <laughs> thank you all so much for just giving this podcast a shot. And hopefully you will stick with us for another 100 episodes after our 100th coming up next week. And again, Tim, thank you so much for coming on to talk about Mission Impossible 2 today. Absolutely. Anytime. Congratulations on 100 episodes. Thank you. It It's kind of crazy. I, I, <laughs> I'm like, wow, I've done so many of these. But, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do it if people weren't listening. So to the listeners, as always, thank you for listening and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.